Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Julie Ewington. I'm the head of the Australian Art Department here at the Gallery. It's my great delight to welcome all the way from Darwin in the Northern Territory, Therese Ritchie, the, the artist. <laughs> As you can tell, a number of supporters have come from Darwin um, and who have lifted the numbers here at the, at the gallery on the weekend. Therese is going to take us through some of the extraordinary stories involved in her work with the sitters of this remarkable group of photographs. Therese. Thank you. Um, look, thank you, Julie. I just want to express my gratitude for, for everyone coming and, and for being included in the show. And, um, and, you know, the people of Queensland and Australia and the world really deserve this place. It's exemplary, you know, in any way, in every way. So thank you. And now I'll, what I'll do is I'll briefly describe to you um, what they're about. And then I'll come back again and finish with this lot. And then you can ask me as many questions as you can squeeze in. Um, so there, I do, I work with a lot of, a lot of some of this work is um, client-based work. For instance, these two here are a, seri a portrait, portraits that I was doing with the Larrakia Nation and the Department of Justice about which is to elevate the status of people called long grasses who are homeless people who live in Darwin and people are homeless in Darwin for many reasons and part of that, pro part of that process was to go around with a field crew um, to all the various urban camps photograph people and interview them and the initial idea for my vision was to get these really big and get them onto the side of buses because a lot of long grasses catch the buses, the number 10. But of course the government just said no, 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 we can't do that. But little did they know that they'd end up at Goma, so ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that, so this is part of, a, part of that particular series, there's many, many more in that. Um, this here, these lovely women here, Nancy Gibbs and Kathleen Vergona, I heard about Nancy Gibbs via a friend who was doing a, a woman called Nikki Fern who's doing a project about the Channel Island Leprosarium, which, and Nancy Gibbs is the last living survivor, and she was um, talking about this amazing woman, and I thought, well, I, I really wanted to meet her. So I went along, and I met her, and I met her, um, girlfriend, companion, Kathleen Vergona, they were inseparable. And so the idea of doing a portrait of Nancy without including Kathleen was just, you know, I couldn't do it. So I did a portrait of both of them together. Um, so that was just something that I wanted to do um, out of a sense of being quite interested in people and the history of the place. Um, this particular woman here uh, and these two are connected I worked for Donate Life over a period of 18 months and Donate Life is based in the intensive care unit of Royal Darwin Hospital and um, they were experiencing well, a lot of average, young Aboriginal people were you know, ending up in intensive care and on life support and often passing away and the process in, in that case, the standard process is to ask people if um, those, their organs can be harvested and that would create quite a lot of distress for the Aboriginal families who are connected to those people. And so we, I was asked to work on creating resources that not only explained um, about intensive care, how you, because a lot of brain injuries were happening through car accidents, etc., etc. So it's explaining about how the brain worked, how it could be damaged, why people end up in intensive care, what happens, explaining everything about what happens leading on to brain death and, and then uh, or harvesting organs. And so we divided the resource, in, resources into that and then into organ donation and transplants, which was a long process and impossible without the input of the likes of this woman who was a kidney recipient. This is um, Jeannie. Um, and she's a Walpuri woman from La Jamanu living in Darwin. And she was my model, as well as many other things, but we created a lot of um, resources together and um, I ended up doing a portrait of her um, juggling organs because she was always talking about, um, you know, if you can donate your organs, whether it be a live or a not live transplant, it's the ultimate act of love. And um, 
you know, anyway, there's many things about that. It's a complex image and my relationship with her is complex, but that's my, that was from my heart, that's not part of the resource, but these two were um, a derivative of that, those resources. This is the Nike renal unit. We, part of the process too was to, because when you're working a lot with Aboriginal people, they will want to discuss or talk about causation and holistic effects, so they don't want to just talk about organ transplants, they want to actually get to you before you get to the, plant, the point of not being sick, not needing a kidney transplant, not needing an organ transplant. So they wanted to educate people about how to take care of your body and body organs. And part of it was to um, do, uh, educate people about um, kidney disease and the function of the kidney. So, and that, because 85% of people who are on dialysis in the Northern Territory, and this is a statistic from probably eight years ago, there are Aboriginal people so kidney disease is pretty prevalent there. And um, this particular man here, I've known for a long time, and he's on dialysis, but he has a dicky heart, so he's not eligible for a transplant, but he was a model in the um, education section about how to use dialysis, how to maintain your lifestyle when you're on dialysis. So these two are called, our organs are sacred, and they're very special to me. Um, this one here, Am I going too quickly? <laughs> I feel like I'm running around some kind of trap. Um, this was taken at the opening of the Paul Fonch exhibition um, in, at the Northern Territory Museum and Art Gallery. Um, that was called The Policeman's Eye and Paul Fonch was the first police inspector of the Northern Territory. This is not him, by the way, because he's a long time dead. This is a, a dress-up policeman from the turn of the 19th century. Um, he was a police inspector from 1870 to 1904 and he was also the paparazzi of that century because he documented all the Larrakia people um, everywhere he went. He used his might and his power and his passion to document um, people in country. He also was renowned for um, cutting down trees so he could get good views and take good photographs of things. But, so in the opening, at the opening, there was a lot of theatrics. There was um, contemporary police and um, people in costume. And then the Kenby Land, Kenby dancers. So the Kenby dancers are connected to the Larrakia people. They are Larrakia. And they are also, um, to me, represent that the Kenby Land claim, which is, you know, the longest land claim in Australian history. It's been going for 35 years and is that whole section of the Cox Peninsula, in fact, which is across the water there, which is in that view. Um, it's just one of those moments where you can collapse time and you get past and present together. And I'd also, at that time, had been documenting an area in Darwin of the Nightcliff and Casuarina shoreline, where I do see, and was seeing, and do see now, um, Aboriginal people constantly being put into the back of police cars and being taken away from public places and spaces and put somewhere else. So it's the irony of cultural events like this and then what's really happening in, the, in, you know, in what you see every day. And I like to, I don't know, I like to capture it. Um, so that's brief. Then we get back to these three. Out, and I'm from Darwin. I like, I like the heat, but I don't like the dry heat. And this is Alice Springs, this is the dry heat. I did, <laughs> she's from Darwin, that woman, she knows what I'm talking about. It's a dry heat. <laughs> Alice Springs. Now, you know, Alice Springs is a bit of a hot spot in the Northern Territory. I don't know if you know about that. Um, but if you really want to know where race relations are at, go to Alice Springs because it's naked, it's raw, and, you know, it's a battle. It's a battleground. So, there's, and, and it fluctuates like any battle, it has it, it ebbs and flows. And I think, I think it was this time last year, um, um, it was a pretty hot time. There was lots of, there was lots of what they call antisocial behavior happening in Alice Springs. And there was, I think it's Action for Alice, or Alice for Action group, where, which is a group of um, businessmen, well-funded people in the Northern Territory or in that particular town who were campaigning to keep people off the streets. Um, and 
the Northern Territory government who's based in Darwin and doesn't really see much beyond the Berrimah line, and that's, you know, which is probably a bit few k's out of Darwin, decided that in their infinite wisdom they'd spend their taxpayers' money and have Parliament sit in Alice Springs. So they paid everyone in their mind just to go and stay in the casino for a week and sit Parliament. And so I thought I'd just go down there and see what the action was like, because it's a hot spot. We like a hot spot. And, um, and so what I did was I only had enough... It was a, you know, our friends donated money and I had enough money to stay there for about five or six days in a hotel in the middle of the town. And my process is to actually, I pick a path that I will take in the morning and in the evening and I follow that path and I take photographs and I meet people and blah, 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 talk to people. And then I do that same thing over and over again, during which I collect images and stories and I get a sense and a feel of the place. And I've always wanted to do... Um, the Todd Mall, which is this, and this is on the way. So in the morning I did the Todd Mall, and in the afternoon I would do from the Todd Mall to the Yipperinia Shopping Centre, up to Coles. Um, and I met lots of people, um, and these are three of them. Julie selected these three, there were, I actually did six I think, um, because it's a complex place, because it, you, you need to know at night, um, to, to make inroads into this antisocial behaviour, which is just having a lot of people in town at once, is they um, have got huge, big generators, very big, very big generators, tall towers with big lights, and they light public places to flush people out, to keep people away from certain areas. So the whole town is, is lit up by these generators at night which keep people moving on. And they, they, consi they consider that a way of keeping the town safe. So it's, it's not an easy place to describe visually. And, um, and I feel like I just kind of got a, a, the edge of it, really. Um, so that's kind of an overview. Um, this body of work was chosen by Julie. And in fact, it's just a diary of my year, really, because I, I, I don't think I read the brief, Julie. <laughs> where I was meant to make the work about. So that's a quick overview. I can go into a bit of detail about this particular area because it is quite complex. And, um, but I'll just, at this point in time, if you're interested in asking any questions, I'm happy for you to ask any questions now. Can I, can I just ask you, in terms of the process, the, the over, the, the over paint, the drawing, the painting, the, what, the, the, the um, what do you do with the photographs and why? What do I do? It's a secret. No, no, no. <laughs> tell us, tell us. It's the mystery of the artist. I will not tell. Now, look, I go around and I've got a little wee camera and I take photographs. So, for instance, um, Nancy and Kathleen, because they were at the aged care facility, I couldn't really take them out. And I was under the instructions of the guardianship mob too because they're in care. So I had, you know, it, you've got to follow process and protocol. So we photographed, we did many sessions with them, but, but I couldn't, I wanted to take them out because behind them actually was a brick wall. So they, they I asked them what their favourite place was because in fact she's from Tennant Creek, she was stolen. Um, so their country is a long way from where they are and they have a favourite picnic place which is if you actually stand on their, in their picnic place, you actually, that's what you see on Nightcliff Beach. So I decided to actually collage it. I paint them, I go from different softwares, I photograph them, I change the colours, um, I paint them, I spend a lot of time painting them over and over and over again because I like to stay with them a lot because I don't really have a life. So, <laughs> and then, you know, I, and I get absorbed by it. So really when I'm working, I've got a big screen which is half the size of this and I'm just working on this area here. So it's lots of different softwares, or two different softwares, maybe three, and then, it, then it's flattened into an image, and then it's printed out. Is it a way of inhabiting the, the image, is it? To I stay with it for, you know, you don't want to let go. In, it's inexplicable. No, I do want to let go. Oh, okay. I don't really want to let go. No, it's inexplicable. I don't know. I just want to get it right. And plus, you know, you just, if you, if you mix the colours um, technically through cyan, magenta, yellow and black and you actually do it on purpose rather than it being a random eyedropper thing, you get a better look. So I like to have complete control. I think it's more just anal retention. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Teresa, I actually have a question. Do you storyboard your images? Do you kind of make out a plan before you begin no. the process? No, not, no, no, I often... Um, this, this is different to this, as this is different to these, because this was a job, and I had a brief, and they wanted something quite romantic. And the interesting thing with these, I mean, this woman's from, she's Pinterby, she's from Kintour, she, but she's living in Darwin. I mean, you know, she's, she definitely looks desert to me. But when we went to their camps, it was not on the, on the beach. But they all, when I asked them, do you want this as the back? Because I take the shot, and then I say, do you want to be represented with this as the background? And they go, no, 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 we like hunting and fishing. You know, she likes fishing. Um, and she wants the beach behind her, as did this woman. And this is a particular um, camp of, of long grasses anyway. This is a Chisum uh, Gumbalanya. She's a Gunwinku speaker, and she's from Awinpeli or Gumbalanya. But she lives in, in a bush camp. So she actually... It's quite urban, but they all want to be on the beach because there's a lot of food there. Um, do a storyboard. So, no, so I ask them what they want. These mob are different because they're more difficult to find. I met him in the morning. In the war, in, I met him in the morning, and then on my afternoon walk from the mall up to the Yipurinya, which is a fascinating walk, and it's only a short walk. Um, I took this shot. So I shot him, uh, probably about six hours difference between the shoot, and then I went and I knew when I shot him that I wanted, I'd seen this the day before, this aspect, and I knew that I wanted to collapse those two because, oh, you know, he's such, he's a very beautiful man and he was lovely and I just, I don't know, I can't really ex describe that one, but the same with this one, that's actually as it is. The police presence in Alice Springs is quite high visible, that's modern contemporary policing, horse, bike, chairs, whatever they are, <laughs> they're everywhere, every 20 minutes. Um, so I actually wanted to get that in and I asked her if I could, because she was actually on the other side, and I said, can you just get over there while those police are walking past? And so she was happy to do that and he was the same. So it just, sometimes, it's not a storyboard thing. With clients I storyboard, with um, Jeannie, it was a complete, it was just fun. She'd been showing me, I'd been shooting for something, she was showing me all the sign language that they use to talk to each other when they don't want to verbalise. So they'll throw something across a whole group of people and they'll communicate with someone over at the back of the room. And so she, I did all these photographs of her and, um, and I asked her if I could do a portrait. And I said, I really just want to do you juggling some organs because she's always talking about saving seven lives and, you know, and... Um, and she said, yeah, that'd be fun, you can do that. And then I didn't know where to place her physically because she's Walpri, which, and she's from Lajmanu, um, which is, you know, in the middle, really, to the left. And I, we were talking, I had um, John Glover, the colonial picturesque, and I was starting talking, you know, talking about land grabbers, painters and artists like myself as land grabbers, you know. And um, she kind of jokingly said, well, you know, why don't you put me into his country? And um, so it kind of evolves, but, you know, it's up to them. And I do make some kind of suggestions sometimes to people, but I've got to have a reasonable relationship with them to make those suggestions. This is, you know, she never loved dogs until she had a kidney transplant, and now she needs, <laughs> she's got a lot of dogs. This is a collage of all her dogs. And they are like her keepers and they, to her they symbolise the woman who donated her kidney to her because she thinks she must have loved dogs because ever since she got a transplant, she, dogs make her cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's an intuitive thing really. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Teresa this afternoon? Very quiet. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, I, um, I do a lot of, I make a lot, I do create a lot of resources, I work with Aboriginal people and 
health practitioners who are pretty eccentric kind of people and I'm kind of in the middle with a whiteboard doing storyboards but it's stick figures. So I, I kind of try, I create resources that merge the two um, medical models I guess um, that, that, that then an Aboriginal audience can use. And so during, and so in that, so I've done stuff on kidney disease, I've done stuff on how the, you know, circulation and just body parts. I'm an Apple girl, I use um, a laptop and a small camera and um, I have a big tablet, a Wacom tablet and a pen and so I paint in that way. So I'm, I'm constantly taking photographs, etc, etc. Um, any other, yes? The format. I know, I know. I, I'm interested in that too. <laughs> because I get stuck on that because it's such an amazingly beautiful place in the Northern Territory and people are so um, attached to where they come from and country and it's so, in my early days, so integral to um, to who people are. So my first introduction to the Northern Territory was in the Gulf of Carpentaria with the Yanual people and they took me on this walk back, they walked back into country after seven years of not being there. And, the, and their communication with the land and the way they sang to it and fell on it and beat it and cried and, you know, hit their chests. And then, you know, th this was a, a, a connection that I was not, had never seen before really significant and really important. So in my work, it's, and it, especially if you're doing work for an Aboriginal audience, you will get a client saying, you know, I'm from Canberra and I want you to do something about Aboriginal people, about, or, you know, let's just say it's heart disease, and I want you to cover everyone from Queensland to Western Australia. You go, well, you can't do that. You know, there's no such thing as a generic person. We have to start at a community, get them to want to do it, and then get them to tell you how to do it, and you know, and then it starts off as a bushfire. Other communities want it, and it's connected to culture, it's connected to country, and it's connected to language. It's imperative, you know, you can't. And so this thing about landscape and country, I know it seems romantic, but it's important to me too. So, and I ask people, and that's what they want. So, may, and, but this is different. I've kind of branched out there. It's a bit risky. Um, yes? What's your dream mission? <sighs> I, don't, I don't. Oh, yeah, well, I'll get your name and your number and I'll get back to you on that because I really don't know. Oh, hello. When you did, um, uh, when you worked with Chips, did you still do this artwork or a different type of artwork? Um, Chips is my inspiration and I, I did this kind of artwork. Chips is a screen printer and he's only got one eye. So he's very good at seeing colours separately and he taught me how to screen print because in those days we did all this by hand. We cut separations by hand. And, um, but he's in, he likes things big. As you know, his work is very big. So I was doing this kind of work but I was more photographic based and more painterly. So we've often combined over the years and we developed a style together. Um, and, but yeah, you, you'll find that Chips, is, Chips will do work like this. So he could probably sign it. And people would think it was his. <laughs> okay, so I think we have time for one quick final question. And um, yes, absolutely. Um, when did you start thinking photography and like painting was all amazing? And when did you start painting and stuff? Um, that's a very good question. I... <laughs> I wanted to be a painter. I wanted to actually paint outside the computer. And um, I went, when I was at um, art school, which was a long time ago, in the 80s, um, I did not get on with my painting lecturer. And I thought, well, this is not going to work. And I looked around for who I would get on with, and there was the photography lecturer. So <laughs> I dropped painting and went and studied photography. But, you know, I have an unfulfilled desire to know how to paint, so clearly this is probably why I spent all this time, you know, it's my, and, and so, and this was in, you know, I was 20, young, 24, so that's when I started, 
And then I got into photojournalism and I got into documentation and the power of the photographic image. But I always used to love drawing. So in the old days I used to draw um, collage, cut and paste and then technology was introduced and I was able to use Photoshop and Painter and Illustrator. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Good. Please um, join me in thanking Therese for that amazing, amazing. <laughs>